All right. It looks like we are ready to get started. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Dana Render, and I'm the Director of Education for Trees Atlanta. And you are joining us in one of our virtual speaker series events called Ask the Expert. Um, Ty Smith is an engineer, and tonight he's going to be talking about beaver dams. So if you're not familiar with Trees Atlanta, our mission is really to protect and grow Atlanta's urban forest. And we do that through planting op opportunities, conservation, and also education opportunities. So Ty Smith, he's our speaker tonight, and he's gonna be talking about the importance of beaver dams to our watershed and a little bit more about the engineering side of them. We want to make sure that we have a welcoming environment for everyone and we also want to make sure that it's as interactive as possible. We will have an opportunity to have a Q&A session with Ty as we get closer to the end of the presentation. There is a Q&A button at the very bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you would use that to submit any questions that you have throughout the presentation, once we get to that point, we will moderate those questions and Ty will answer them. We also wanna make sure that we can serve you better with what we're offering. There will be a survey that comes to your email at the end of this presentation. And we ask that you give us some feedback so that we know how to get better. And also, if there are any topics that you would like to know. If you wanna learn more about Trees Atlanta, or if you wanna sign up for more opportunities to learn like this, or even to volunteer, feel free to go to our website at www.treesatlanta.org. And also you can find us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So I'm gonna give it to Ty. Great, thanks Dana, appreciate that. Let's share our screen. Okay, y'all, can you see it? Yep, we're good. Okay, great. Yeah, Dana, thank you so much for, for the wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. I appreciate being here and continuing to help Trees Atlanta's mission. I believe in it, and I know that all y'all do as well. Um, and I wanna first and foremost say that I am by no means an expert. I, I'm learning every day, just as like everybody else, but Really today, what I wanna to talk about with y'all is watersheds, ecosystem, re ecosystem restoration, as well as beaver dams. Before we get too far ahead into the presentation, I just wanna give you a little background about myself. Um, as the wise Joe Dirt once said, there's business in the front and party in the back. I am an Atlanta native. I went to UGA and got my uh, environmental engineering degree there, yes, UGA does have engineering, and yes, it's pretty good. Uh, after I went to UGA, I went to UVA and got my master's degree focused in water resources engineering and specifically within open channel systems and ecosystem restoration. I'm a licensed engineer. I've been practicing for about seven years, and I've been, I've had the privilege to work in many different locations throughout the entire United States as well as parts of Canada, as you can see over here in this right screen, um, ranging, you know, all the way up the East Coast and even out West and up into Canada. I worked for a while for CH2M Hill um, and I transitioned to Hazen and Sawyer about a year and a half ago where I call now call, call home. In my meantime, um, because it's, it's healthy for everybody to have, uh, uh, you know, interests in activities outside of their work. I play guitar and bass in a cover band. So if you guys need a, uh, a wedding singer, uh, you, know, you can also hit, hit us up for that as well. I enjoy hiking, camping, and fishing with my uh, beautiful wife and our two dogs, as well as cooking great food. Um, we've gotten even better at it over COVID, right? Um, been getting into biking as well as volunteering for a while with, with Trees Atlanta and just now getting started with Big Brother and Big Sister. So the learning objectives for today are those that you can see on the screen. So it's, what is a watershed? I think some of us generally know what it is and I generally understand it um, from you know, environmental science when we're, when we're back in third grade, but we can zoom in a little bit more if we want or keep it at that phase. 
Um, the second objective is to just discuss why we restore streams and wetlands. So why do we, uh, you know, tear things up just to build it back? Um, and what can we learn from beavers in the urban environment or the rural environment? And how are they important to our watersheds and our ecosystems? So the first topic, what is a watershed? Uh, as you can see on the screen here, the watersheds are literally everywhere. Um, a watershed is defined as a physical area where precipitation, whether that's rain, snow, sleet, hail, collects on a surface and effectively drains over that surface to a common location, whether that is to a lake or a pond uh, or uh, an ocean, what have you. Now, all of these watersheds, they, they effectively um, perform in different ways. You know, they can stay above ground or in some cases they can retreat underground. So an example of, of a watershed draining to an underground system or an aquifer is, uh, for example, in Austin, Texas, where that particular city relies on the Edwards Aquifer as their primary as their prim primary drinking water supply, so all of these surface processes or these collect these surface collection systems drain the precipitation to a common point where you know where we live and where we play. Um, as you can already see in this this uh, graphic over here on the right, this effectively acts as one of those particular processes in the greater water cycle. I think many of us probably remember from you know, our uh, early education how the water cycle generally works, where we have you know, precipitation, evaporation, transpiration. Um, so it's just one of those critical elements that are doing the work for producing the water that we drink and the water we play in. So watersheds can also be pretty interesting. Um, you know, they have uh, various sizes and shapes and, you know, we're still studying them, them today. Um, this video here that I'll play right now effectively just uh, shows from a very high level, you know, how water as it hits the surface can effectively go into those common drainage points. So as you see in this, this video right here, those taller places in the landscape generally have that reddish or yellow color and water effectively runs off those steep, steeper gradients down into the, the lower gradients or like the lighter yellows and the greens. And so these are tools that people still use today to effectively deter determine how uh, hydrology and hydraulics will function over the landscape. It's more than just a, a sandbox. People use these to determine how, how can this work? So, you know, we might be, we might have been thinking about hydrology, um, you know, for quite a while now, but we're still playing with it today, which I, I find fascinating. So bringing it all back home, um, we live in the Chattahoochee watershed. Chattahoochee watershed is made up of, of three different units, as you can see over here on the left. Um, it's made of the upper Chattahoochee watershed that drains to uh, Gainesville, then the middle Chattahoochee, where we, most of us live in the metro Atlanta area, and then to the lower Chattahoochee, uh, which effectively defines the border of Georgia and Alabama before dra draining into uh, the, the Gulf down here. So this is called uh, the ACT or Appalachia Cola Basin, um, effectively draining you know, and providing most of the water supply for Metro Atlanta area. And Lake Lanier, this giant blob up here in the northeast corner of the state is our primary surface water supply for all of the metro Atlanta area. Zooming in a little bit closer, I know that most of us probably live inside the city limits. 
um, you know, we have many creeks and streams, whether they're day lit or, you know, open air or piped that effectively drain quite a bit of our area. Our city sits on a ridge, which is pretty interesting. You know, we, we are a headwater city, if you want to call it that. Um, so downtown is about where I'm heading, uh, hovering over right now. Um, and uh, effectively everything uh, northeast of the city and north of the city drains to the Chattahoochee River, uh, as you can see in this map right here, whereas everything south of I-20 and just a little bit uh, west of 7585 uh, drains to the South River. What's even more interesting is that we live in an area where we actually have a continental divide. So DeKalb Avenue is actually our one is a geographic or geologic land feature that is defines uh, whether you know a single water droplet will end up either down in the Gulf Coast or will head its way down towards Savannah. So that means you know if if it if you're headed if you're headed west on DeKalb, you might you're and you you dump your water bottle out, it might head down. Uh, your water might head down to uh, down to Florida, whereas if you head east towards Decatur on DeKalb, it actually might head down to Savannah. But you know, I, water is all well and good, but what does it actually mean? You know, water is life. Uh, you know, and it is economies too. Um, you know, from the headwaters in Helen, uh, Chattahoochee provides you know not just recreation, um, but also you know surface water supply. And you know this is this is an economy, um, whereas you know in the middle picture this is a photo of Lake Lanier. This is like I said earlier, our primary surface water supply for most, if not all, of the Metro Atlanta area. So this is the engine, uh, or this is this is the fuel or oil, if you want to call it in some sort of uh, some sort of sense like that, that uh, keeps our economy going. You can't grow without water. And then finally, on the right, you know, the water drains down to Appal Apalachicola Bay. I love oysters and, you know, our water in the Chattahoochee uh, effectively drains down to Florida and Apalachicola Bay and helps, uh, you know, helps facilitate uh, economies like these guys who are making money off of making sure that water quality and the water quantity end up where they need it to be. So the next big question is why in the world do we restore streams and wetlands? You know, I thought these systems were just, um, they were just, you know, basically conduits to make sure that flooding doesn't happen um, and that water needs to just get away as, as quick as possible um, so that it's, it's not a bother to us. Um, it, there's more to that, you know, uh, streams, are in wetlands are life and they provide quite a lot of benefits beyond just um, you know making sure that you know water drains from one area they provide habitat they provide recreation and they provide economies as well so this slide i know is a little bit busy but there are so many reasons and more for why we restore streams. And each one of these photos effectively uh, characterize some of the reasons why we go about um, getting in the creek and making sure that uh, it's healthy and it's performing the way that we want to. Um, the photo on the left seems like a, uh, like a no-brainer, right? Uh, we, we restore streams and wetlands to make sure that we have high water quality. Uh, there's some communities uh, in the metro Atlanta area that prioritized stream and wetland restoration solely on uh, ensuring that there's less stream bank and stream bed erosion to make sure that the water that we all go to drink from our faucets is a little bit cleaner because uh, sediment can be viewed as a proxy for, uh, or can harbor um, you know, unwanted nutrients or pollutants as well. Uh, this photo to the right 
is one that we probably see more often than not. Uh, you know, it's this is uh, stream banks that are you know that uh, that are eroding quickly and they're migrating towards uh, buildings or they're migrating towards um, you know uh, roadways or other critical infrastructure or assets that people own or municipalities own, like a city, like the city of Atlanta. Um, and so we restore streams in this instance to help mitigate erosion to protect assets. The photo on the right is a little gross. I apologize, my, my, my little pup is uh, having, a, having a bark. But the photo on the right here is a photo of a collapsed uh, sanitary sewer. So um, engineers early on and very intelligently determined that we, hey, we should put our sanitary sewer pipes um, close to the stream so that, uh, not, and preferably not within the stream to be absolutely clear, so that we can reduce pumping costs. So, you know, running a pump requires electricity uh, and it can be quite expensive. Um, and so uh, in some instances, we still have uh, sewer crossings um, and we still have failure due to stream bank erosion that it can effectively jeopardize some of these sanitary sewer assets. And so another way of going about restoring streams is to also protect sanitary sewers so that it doesn't leak into the stream so we can protect the, uh, the the fish and wildlife, as well as human health um, from sanitary sewer overflows. Other reasons include even larger ones, right? Where, you know, maybe you guys have seen some photos of, of dam removals out west. I think this is from the Elwha River in, uh, in Washington, where, you know, there are migratory uh, threatened and endangered species like uh, uh, Chinook salmon, what have you, that it's, they're literally um, blocked from going back up into the stream for, to produce um, or regenerate their, uh, their, their young, right? And so some of these dams were built eons ago uh, and really serve no uh, valuable purpose for you know, society anymore. And so uh, they become more of a liability than, than not. And so dam removal, uh, although quite big in, in scale and size is also one of the reasons why we go about restoring streams. Probably one of the largest ones and speaking to, you know, dam removal is, is for habitat creation. Um, photo right here is a brook trout. Um, this is our native uh, trout in North America. Um, rainbow and, and brown trout were actually introduced um, from other places. And this is actually our native species here. And so quite a bit of restoration is specific to those native species to help, help uplift their ecosystems and facilitate um, you know, their habitat. So thinking like the salmon, like uh, cutthroat trout, like these types of species so that we can create and ensure that they have habitat availability. Zooming out a little bit more, uh, this photo right here is um, a photo of the Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay has a um, regulatory requirement on it right now to effectively uh, reduce down the pollutants from all the way up in the, up in the upper watershed into the bay to reduce down the pollutants on, uh, within this, that particular surface water. So, there are kind of bigger picture, huge water scale approaches to ensure that you know, pollutants don't continue to go downstream. This photo right here was actually um, just downstream of a project that I worked on for quite a while. Um, and it's very indicative of, of a lot of stuff that we see. Um, this is you know, a channelized concrete lined uh, stream that floods more often than not. Um, you know, even though it is a concrete channel. So uh, quite a lot of projects are also designed to reduce flood, flooding into urban areas by um, effectively recapturing space um, or widening the channel, or 
creating uh, different kind of approaches to reduce uh, flooding impacts on the urban landscape. And then lastly, this, this photo right here is just a screenshot of uh, the, the new-ish 316 interchange. Um, this, you know, another one of the reasons why we do restoration is because of, you know, big transportation or uh, electrical infrastructure. Um, you know, quite a lot of our uh, streams and, and power lines are near, um, near our streams. And uh, when people build these types of facilities, they have to pay towards mitigation because they're impacting, uh, they're impacting our water bodies. So I know that was a lot um, and it's a lot to take in, but the purpose of this was just to say, hey, we don't just do it for one reason. There's many different reasons. And because there's many different reasons, there's many different goals. And so there's different objectives. And so um, I think, you know, it's everybody defines um, restoration and success differently. And so in each one of these photos and each one of these types of approaches, success or even a design would be completed in a different kind of way. So um, the most recent project that I've been working on is a, uh, for the most common reason, like I mentioned before, it is for a uh, restoration for an endangered species. So the photo on the left or the, the drawing on the left is for the Rio Grande civil, silver, silvery minnow, excuse me, um, in, near uh, Albuquerque. And, uh, you know, most, if not, you know, uh, just about most of our projects are facilitating, uh, you know, habitat uplift um, for these types of threatened endangered species. Um, and then the, the photo below is of a salmon. Um, and so these types of projects are absolutely more common where, you know, we have these channelized systems where we don't have um, a good floodplain access so that these, these uh, floodplain uh, preferencing uh, species can actually get back up onto the, onto the landscape um, and lay their eggs and find refuge until the floodwaters recede. So I have a quick photo, it's a time lapse of what a restoration, one, one restoration project can generally look like. Um, you know, again, like I said just a minute ago, restoration projects come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, but this is a fairly common uh, restoration style, um, at least out west, specifically for threatened and endangered species. Now, what you'll note when you're watching this, this quick time lapse is that it's messy. It takes, sometimes it takes Tonka trucks, it takes excavators, it takes large amounts of, of uh, material and many different people with different expertises to come in here to make sure that things work. And sometimes things look messy. To some, this actually might you know, look a little messy. Restoration and ecological uplift generally can and should look messy because it's those, those types of uh, niches in, uh, in the landscape that actually help and facilitate that kind of um, success for those types of species. But this might not be as desirable, uh, you know, for a sanitary sewer um, protection project. But as you can see, uh, the project, at least this one in Oregon, is, uh, you know, it's not just one tiny channel that is throttling the water through. It's, it's spread across the landscape and it's actually mimicking, uh, it's mimicking uh, beaver style processes where they're building dams, dispersing the water across the floodplain. So the most common reasons that we uh, design projects and build projects that are stream related or wetland re related in the city are for all those reasons that I just mentioned. You know, it's, it's, it's for flood improvements. It's because an outfall uh, from, uh, you know, development is failing. 
um, you know, it's because of roadways, uh, sanitary sewer uh, um, issues, creation of park systems. But the most important thing is to always include you know, stakeholders, those folks that, you know, that use the site on a daily basis or very frequently to make sure that the project is, uh, is, is a success. Um, but that's all to say that, you know, when you're doing these types of projects in the city, it can get a little tricky. You have a lot you have to consider. Um, and sometimes you have to, you know, uh, you have to compromise, um, you know, you might not be able to have the same type of large scale restoration where you're dispersing water across the floodplain um, when you know you're in a very confined space where there's you know there's houses or um, you know there's critical sewer infrastructure that um, folks from the city have to go maintain on a yearly basis. So there are, you know, different types of approaches and different types of ways that people go about approaching ecosystem restoration or just restoration or stabilization in general in the city. But there's still quite a bit that we can learn from beavers and, you know, they are really the ecosystem engineers that, you know, that really help facilitate, um, you know, quite a bit of a lot of the water resources and steam stormwater engineering that we see today. Quite a bit of the approaches that we took, um, you know, back then were kind of in response to the beaver, but um, we're starting to learn more and more um, year by year that what they did was all actually the right way of going about doing it versus uh, the more traditional ways that we see, you know, in the 1950s where it's just, you know, blowing and going. As many of y'all know, beaver were around for millennia. <laughs> they, uh, you know, they had, uh, they had their, uh, you know, they had dams just about everywhere uh, in North America, and they've actually started to reintroduce them in different locations. As you can see, they are actually starting to to bring them up near Finland. I've actually heard, uh, read publications about. Um, application or reintroduction in, uh, in the UK, and then obviously down here in, in the south tip of Patagonia. But, you know, North American beaver really defined our, uh, our landscape um, very early on. And, you know, for quite a while, we decided that we wanted to fight against it. Um, the most important thing to note is that it does, they don't really care where they are. They're, they're um, opportunists. So the photo over here on the right is actually a photo of uh, a former beaver dam um, actually in Blue Hair Nature Preserve, not even 10 years ago. So if you all haven't been to Blue Hair Nature Preserve, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic park here in the city, just in that North Buckhead community. Um, but you know, we have them just about everywhere you look. Uh, they're more common than you would think. Um, and they're more than just, you know, in those idyllic locations in, you know, uh, in North Georgia or South Georgia, they can be in the city too. Um, you know, our relationship with beaver has drastically changed, just like I said ago, you know, uh, back then we considered beaver to be a commodity, right? Um, you know, we as, an economy, you know, when we first uh, you know, moved to the quote unquote new world, uh, you know, we trapped and sold beaver pelts so that we could create nice little fancy hats like you see on the left. Um, so we depleted our beaver um, and it took a long time for us to kind of bounce back and we're still bouncing back. But, you know, we're starting to realize um, after this you know, pretty significant uh, reduction in, in the amount of beaver that we had in North America that, hey, we really need them. They're doing things a lot better than we ever, ever could. Um, and so there's been publications and, and um, you know, and uh, articles that have been coming out you know, super regularly over the past uh, 10 years that are just pointing to, you know, 
let's let's go back to the way that um, you know nature does best. You know, there's been many different publications, um, you know, uh, basically stating that hey, you know, the way that we've been approaching restoration uh, sure can work in different types of approaches, but if we really want to perform um, restoration in a way that uplifts the entire project site without having to denude it or remove, you know, uh, remove, uh, you know, quite a bit of existing features out on site, um, we can kind of take the same kind of approach and do it in a way that's very successful. Um, you know, these particular publications, um, I kind of made them a, a little bit abbreviated. If y'all would like for me to include them in kind of like, I guess, uh, you know, so for some nice bedtime reading, if you want. Um, you know, these have been quoted many times over just proving the importance of beaver mimicry in order to effectively return back to um, more stable or, you know, uh, stable is a, a difficult word, but or maybe the wrong word in this case, but an, a, a good equilibrium rather um, for ecological uplift. Um, I can absolutely more than welcome to uh, pass this along. But the way that we mimic this, or we can mimic, mimic it, is through these features called beaver dam analogs. And so these are, these are effectively wood-based structures that are supposed to effectively uh, mimic beaver activity in the stream where we're, you know, collecting sediment and we are uh, entrapping uh, woody debris in order to perform, uh, you know, channel lifting processes from a geomorphology standpoint and disperse those floodwaters over the floodplain so we can get good connection and um, increased uh, stability. Um, you know, these structures are not necessarily, or they don't have to be constructed with, uh, you know, Tonka trucks and big excavators. These can be installed by hand by, you know, a group of three or four folks that want to go get the job done. Um, you know, this is something that uh, is letting the stream do the work instead of the tractor. Um, these types of approaches are also extremely uh, cheap as compared to more, you know, quote unquote, traditional uh, stream restoration methodologies uh, because they're simple uh, and you're not bringing in that type of machinery. Um, there's also other types of, process, uh, of, of structures or wood-based structures too. Um, you know, there are also ones called post-assisted log structures and and those particular features do things a little bit differently and they actually uh, help recruit sediment from the bed and banks while entrapping uh, uh, wood as well. So this isn't really an old concept. You know, um, like I said, you know, before beaver have been around for a long while um, and our approach for mimicking them is no different. You know, uh, the photo on the left is a photo from France in the 1870s where, you know, folks were trying to mitigate agricultural runoff and that, you know, spurred uh, pretty substantial erosion because, um, you know, we didn't necessarily do the best agricultural practices back then and we might not be doing the same today. But, you know, we have um, been trying these types of approaches that mimic beavers for a long time. Uh, whether that you know is over in Europe and or even to uh, you know out west in the 1930s as we tried to expand uh, you know our footprint and, and increase agricultural productivity. So these types of approaches and this type of application, um, as of right now, uh, it's a whole lot more common out west, um, just largely because it's uh, it's a little bit more sparse. You know, um, the application of these types of approaches of mimicking beaver and their particular dam-like structures is really to 
effectively put, again, put water on the landscape to increase resiliency um, and make sure that grazing lands can remain um, stable and wet. Um, what's been really interesting is, especially in recent years, uh, you know, during you know, quite a bit of these uh, um, pretty substantial wildfires out west, is studies have been that have shown that you know mimicking beavers in this type of approach actually you know reduces the uh, the, the amount of devastation that that wildfires have on ran uh, on rangelands and in other areas. So they're they're a really powerful tool, not just from an ecological perspective, but also from a uh, you know, physical land preservation perspective as well. But, you know, um, there's always an outlier and hopefully we'll be one again soon. We, uh, we designed a project which we'll talk about in just a second. I've got a, I've got a nice case study uh, that we'll talk about um, in just a moment um, down here in Atlanta, actually at Blue Heron Nature Preserve. So, you know, we, we're the, as of right now, we're the lone blue dot in the Southeast, but um, I think there's going to be more, um, you know, more and more folks are starting to look towards this type of approach for ecosystem restoration to mimic beavers and their, and their dams in order to, uh, you know, really make a good mark uh, and increase ecological productivity. Our project, I think, is actually the largest urban, um, urban beaver dam analog project, I think, in the country right now, too. So, uh, be sure to run up to, to Blue Heron and check it out. So our project, like I said, is in Blue Heron Nature Preserve. Um, it is closer to the Emma Wetlands area. So it's, uh, you know, just, it's um, kind of in, tucked away in a little uh, kind of community here in North Buckhead. Um, our project is in this, you know, dashed red area along Mill Creek. Um, Mill Creek is, uh, is a, a stream that effectively uh, you know, dumps into Nancy Creek and Nancy Creek then uh, uh, discharges into Chattahoo the Chattahoochee River you know along the along the perimeter here. So you know bringing it all back home and thinking about how you know each of these smaller streams and, and creeks kind of fill back into you know, the larger picture where, you know, this Chattahoochee River is kind of the lifeblood of our community. And there's many more of these smaller streams and tribs that, um, you know, can really help enhance and enhance ecology as well as provide water quality. The image on the right here is the, uh, the drainage area or the watershed uh, that drains to our project site. So the area is about 1.3 square miles, so pretty large, um, and drains some of uh, the areas with uh, Lenox Mall and, and the Phipps Plaza area. So it's got a lot of imperviousness, you know, when, when rains come, when rains come, it really just uh, goes straight to the creek, uh, gets very channelized, and, um, you know, you have those erosion problems and, and other issues that come along with that. Our particular project site has seen quite a bit of history. I mean, you know, we, uh, we've been moving and, and pulling and pushing our streams in all sorts of different ways, making them do all sorts of different, different types of things. And this particular site's no different. So early on, um, in, you know, in the early 1930s, the, the stream was actually dammed. This was an active mill pond um, that effectively produced a product uh, for sale. Um, in the, about the 1980s, that, that pond was breached or the dam was breached. And, you know, we started to rapidly increase in urban development. You can see a pretty substantial difference between the left photo here from 1938 and the right photo here. So the stream, you know, again, uh, was, found its, its preferential flow path, um, or it was probably moved. Uh, for engineering uh, and, and construction purposes. We can build these communities adjacent to the area. But, you know, fast forward to today, it's continuing to move and, and get pushed and pulled. 
so you can see the difference um, between the, you know, the alignment of the channel between um, then and now moving from one side of the valley to the other. So the goal of the project was to effectively increase water quality by reducing sediment into Nancy Creek by you know, pushing those floodwaters onto the floodplain uh, while increasing habitat uh, out on site and providing increased flood attenuation, like I said, putting the water on the floodplain uh, because this, uh, because of the geography of this area can actually act as almost like a bowl uh, and attenuate those, those significant rain events um, before discharging into Nancy Creek. Uh, the other uh, goal was to reduce site impacts um, during the construction phase. Um, like I said earlier, uh, you know, construction of ecosystem restoration projects, not all of them are pretty. Sometimes, uh, sometimes there's, there's tree removal, which is unfortunate, or there's, you know, issues with, you know, you have to, you have to really kind of um, scrape clean the site before you, uh, before you start to, uh, you know, do some of the restoration approaches. This, this uh, particular approach doesn't require that, you know, we're, we're installing these wood structures to um, lift that channel and get the water on the floodplain without having to bring any big trucks. You know, our design approach for this particular project was pretty standard um, from a, uh, you know, a design perspective. Um, you know, we did, you know, just about all the key steps that you see over here on the right side of the screen, you know, going through the characterization, investigation, monitoring, um, developed plan sets so the project can be constructed, permitted, uh, you know, through um, the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure that we, uh, you know, we weren't, we were following all, all associated laws um, and, you know, started to actually construct the project. And so what we managed to do here on on site was actually introduce um, 13 uh, beaver-like structures or beaver dam-based structures out at the Blue Hair Nature Preserve site to effectively create eco ecological uplift and channel raising properties. Uh, the type of structures that we used, um, this is a really busy uh, slide and I'm not intending to you know, dive into it, but the purpose of it is just to say, it's more than just putting wood in a creek, you know, um, wood floats. Uh, so you have to kind of do a little bit of engineering to make sure that uh, things will stay in place or they will function the way that you intend them to do. So our monitoring program was actually pretty, pretty robust. You know, we're working with several folks, um, you know, here in the Metro Atlanta area at uh, different uh, universities. So uh, Liz Suddeth at Gwinnett College is amazing. She is a beaver biologist. So if there's any person that I could recommend to y'all to connect with, um, if you're interested in more about beaver biology, she's the, absolutely the one to go to. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Ledford here in the photo on the left actually uh, specializes in, in urban hydrology. And you know, she has developed a really robust monitoring program to make sure that this particular project is meeting those types of goals that we set out early on for this particular project. Um, we are also using uh, 360 imagery so we can see the, that progressive change over time. So this, again, this type of approach in, of restoration isn't using trucks or excavators to, you know, um, mold the banks or mold the channel. It's really using these structures to push and pull the stream in such a way that, uh, you know, it's uh, doing the work for us. Um, our friends at the Amphib Amphibian Foundation are doing aquatic and geomorphic surveys too. So they're measuring beyond just the chemical processes and, and all these other uh, elements. They're actually, you know, taking physical measurements over time to see how well the project is performing. Last but not least, you know, community is super, super important. Um, so this was actually a photo taken before COVID, so don't worry. Uh, you know, everything was 
hopefully fine back then. Um, you know, the project included community involvement. You know, um, you can't be successful with a project this size unless you involve the community early on and keep the community involved and informed throughout the duration of the project. You know, it's it's super fun to see, uh, you know, uh, kids like my friend Joey, uh, my, my friend Joe, uh, son Joey, that, you know, come out and, and installing live stakes or installing, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, putting in trees together to make this project a reality. Construction for these types of projects is pretty straightforward, as you can see in the, uh, the video over here on the right. It takes a team of three or four. Um, you install you install these uh, these these posts with a pneumatic post driver, like you would um, if you're you know setting uh, you know a large fence, and they're effectively driving it into the bed at a specific depth, and then after they do that, they start to weave and pack material inside of this run, if you will, between the posts to make sure that we're elevating the water surface as best we can um, and packing it so that you can have that staging effect. So it takes some time, it's a little bit different, um, but it actively provides that uh, immediate benefit and that immediate uh, process um, you know, from day one, which is fantastic. Um, the photo on the left here is actually a BDA that was installed by volunteers, I think in 2015 or 2016, I can't recall. Um, but this one was actually um, very early on. It was done a little bit differently. Um, and, you know, after, you know, reinstallation, we, you know, managed to get exactly what we wanted. Um, you know, this is the exact same structure in the exact same location over here with this video on the right where we're raising the channel, we're capturing sediment, and we're dispersing those floodwaters over the, over the, the beaver dam uh, uh, across the floodplain, reducing velocities and, and the power erosivity of the stream. So it was a big success. You know, but with every project, there's a lot of lessons learned. Um, you know, there, we definitely had our challenges with this particular project. Um, and whether that is as simple as um, you know, gathering and preparing construction materials, you know, the, the posts are fairly large, and you know, these are hardwood species. So you know, you know, making sure that we can kind of get a nice pointed edge at the end takes a little bit of time. Um, so that was a little bit of an unintended um, uh, or unforeseen uh, uh, issue, I suppose. Um, but you know, we got the job done. Um, the photo here in the middle is, is definitely maybe probably our biggest lesson learned um, where, you know, just making sure that field, en field engineers are there out on site to make sure that the structures are uh, properly constructed and tied in so that they're, um, you know, really performing the type of uh, process that we want for that particular structure. Um, again, you know, this is, it's an the process-based restoration approach. So these, you know, we're not bringing in any trucks to make it work. We're letting the, the stream do the work. And in some sort of sense, you know, this evolution is natural. Um, end cutting and erosion occurs everywhere. Doesn't matter if it's a restored site or not. Um, but this was an unintended and undesired loca undesirable loca location for that to happen. And you know, there's also other human element and site considerations that um, weren't as, you know, perfectly sorted out earlier on. Um, you know that that uh, connection and communication with the community is really important uh, to make sure that it's you know a success not just from the you know the project owner but across the community that use the entire site. But we believe that this, this particular project, um, Blue Heron, uh, is just one of you know, the, the many, uh, many 
blue dots and green dots in the city that can help uplift uh, and enhance Atlanta's urban ecology. You know, I know this is a, it's, it's a touchy, touchy subject, but um, you know, you have to start somewhere, right? And I'd rather take the glass half full approach rather than empty. And so we believe that this project is just one of those uh, you know, great green or blue dots to help make sure that uh, Atlanta's urban ecology um, is strong and will continue to be strong. So with that being said, that's about all I had. Um, we've got about 12-ish or 10-ish minutes or so uh, for Q&A. Um, Yes, absolutely. So I do have um, two questions. Sure. First one is, are there any restrictions to installing um, a BDA in the creek that runs behind my house? It's a good question. Um, it depends on the creek, to be absolutely honest. Um, you know, it depends if how big it is. So is it a FEMA regulated or, uh, you know, mapped stream. Um, if so, there's probably some engineering constrictions or excuse me, considerations that you'd need to have because you'd be, um, you know, you'd effectively be, be changing some of those regulatory requirements as well as, um, you know, likely you would need to um, also coordinate with uh, you know, some of the, some re other regulators to make sure that you're following all rules and regulations. Um, you know, it's not like I said, it's not as simple as just throwing some um, some woods and, and stone in the creek. It takes a little bit of engineering too, um, but you know, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. Um, but just understand that there's other uh, considerations that have to be made. And from the same person, just a little bit of clarification. It's about a three to four feet wide stream. It's mapped, and um, he was asking if there are any how-to instructions that are readily accessible. Okay. Um, so the best uh, resource that I would recommend is um, there is a Utah State um, Restoration Workbook that's called uh, Low Tech Process-Based Restoration. And it really walks you through um, you know, the approach and the, and the reasoning and the science behind um, these types of structures and how to install them correctly and properly. Um, so I, I highly recommend starting there. There's also some great YouTube videos too. Um, I think that's probably the best resource that I would recommend. Awesome. And that um, there's a, I did put the URL for the website for the low tech. Um, restoration inside the chat. So if anyone else is interested in that, it is there. Um, I also had a couple of questions about beavers, about what is the minimum recommended available area in which to reintroduce beavers in an urban environment and what other factors need to be considered when assessing whether to reintroduce beavers? Hmm, that's a good question. So um, specifically about in terms of just general size, beavers are everywhere and they can be everywhere. Um, you know, we, we see beaver populations on massive uh, stream, um, stream networks, but also smaller, tiny tribs and, and creeks too. Um, to be absolutely clear, I am no <laughs> beaver biologist, um, so I can't necessarily speak to, you know, uh, specific requirements or anything like that. But generally, uh, you know, beavers are you know, adaptable and they can be just about anywhere. Um, and then in terms of relocation, um, I, I think that might be something that is probably not a super great idea. It's maybe one of those approaches where instead of forcing it to happen, you let it happen. It's one of those, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> um, and there's also great resources and, and contacts. And thank you, Dana. Um, at aware that can really help you if you're if you're wanting to relocate or kind of help you know the beaver population I suppose in our Atlanta area. Is there anything um, so someone recently saw a deceased beaver in their neighborhood? Is there anything that can be done to better protect the beavers and also their home 
and um, as they're building in the watershed areas as well? Yeah, um, good question. Um, in terms of just making sure that beavers stay happy, healthy, and alive, um, slowing down is, is one of them, making sure that uh, you know, folks are um, driving slowly, across, especially across those bridges and creeks. Um, you know, beavers migrate. They, um, they're opportunistic. They don't just stay within the channel. They go in the overbank. Um, so making sure that there's adequate passage and just acknowledgement that, that, hey, you know, more than deer cross through here, there are other species as well. So <laughs> there's a pretty amazing sign um, down kind of near my neck of the woods uh, in the tapestry area where there's actually a beaver uh, beaver lookout sign instead of a deer sign. Uh, so, you know, there's different kind of educational approaches and different types of ways of going about it. Yes, and actually over in the Grant Park, Ormwood Park area, um, we, I think there were, were some beavers that actually came back to the area yeah. after a while. So that's really fascinating to see when they um, kind of reclaim some habitat. Um, Someone has another question. Did you see any beavers at Blue Heron? Are there any there? There used to be, but we're hoping that our structural structures will bring them back. So I don't know too much about beaver biology and their preferences, but I do know when they hear falling water, they're very attracted to it. And so those, um, you know, these types of structures can help facilitate that type of mimicry that they, they want. Um, and so hopefully we'll, we'll bring them back. But, you know, beavers have been on site at this particular location um, at, at Blue Heron, and, and we're hoping that they're coming back. Um, someone has a question about, um, in some of the restored project areas that you've worked on, Ty, do you know about um, any beavers being reintroduced to that restored project area? So um, that's a good question. So we, again, haven't really uh, physically reintroduced beavers. I, I actually technically think from a legal perspective, um, movement of beavers, physically speaking, um, is likely illegal um, by fish and wildlife requirements. Um, so we take more of a passive approach instead of a an active one. Awesome. Thank you, Ty. Okay. I am not seeing any other questions that are coming through. Um, but I feel that we learned a lot this evening, especially about the importance of watershed, why it's important in cities, and then how beavers are incredibly smart and that we've learned a lot from them and informs a lot of our engineering choices today. So just to let you all know, this has been recorded and we will send it back out to everyone that's registered for the event. So that way you can watch it again. And also if you have any questions about wildlife or if you come across any wildlife, be sure to connect with AWARE. AWARE is a wonderful nonprofit that works specifically to help wildlife. And their website is awarewildlife.org. And um, their website is pretty easy to navigate if you um, need to connect with them or if you have some wildlife that needs rehabilitation that you've seen in an area where you live. So with that said, I would really like to thank you, Ty, for speaking with us tonight. We appreciate all of your wisdom and knowledge. And we also thank all of our attendees for attending this evening as well. You guys have a wonderful evening and stay warm out there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dana.